So, when I say that I speak German without an accent, that means that I speak German without a US accent. Are we clear on that? Also, ich spreche Deutsch nicht so, sondern wie ein deutscher Mensch. Es wird mir oft gesagt, dass ich fast akzentfrei spreche und das für mich, das ist das beste Kompliment, das man von einem Muttersprachler bekommen kann. Also, heute wollte ich mal ein bisschen darüber reden. Ja, yeah, also, I think I don't talk as much about like specifics of having a good German accent as I do like how to get a good German accent. I talk all the time about like, oh, you have to listen to podcasts, you have to shadow, you have to, you know, listen to music and, you know, focus on auditive resources. But in terms of like the specifics of what actually goes into a like native sounding accent, I think I've barely spoken on that, if not like at all. So let's talk about it. Lessons, lessons davon reden. <laughs> So, before I even get into any specifics, I want to talk about why is having a good accent important? Let's do a personal reason first. So for me, as a person from the US, we have the kind of reputation all over the world that we are not good at learning languages, that we suck at speaking them, and that we have terrible accents. Um, and that for me, the third one and the last one, that is, I think it's the easiest thing that a person can do to kind of ward off that stereotype. Because even if you speak just a tiny, tiny bit of your language that you're learning, if you speak it with a good accent, and you obviously establish like more rapport. People see that you put more effort into learning the language and it, you know, it just generally feels good. I think it also, you know, it can give you a confidence boost if you're, especially in the beginning stages, if you have a good accent. So for me, it's all about appearance, <laughs> which is kind of stupid, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a real, real thing. I don't know, I think people are more eager to talk to you and like want to help you a little bit more if you have a good accent in my experience and that's just in general not just with German because like under all of my like Portuguese videos even the ones from like the beginning or like you know maybe a year after I started learning when I still wasn't really that good because I had a good accent people were like yes go you you're doing great and it's like a big confidence booster I think so that's why an accent has always been important to me and that's why I always put a lot of effort into it especially at the beginning and with that said now I guess I should talk about the I guess the problems the pronunciation problems that people usually have with German. I mean it really depends on the person that's learning it and like what their native language is and stuff like that but I think that there are a couple of universal difficult pronunciation things in German. I think these are the difficult features of German that literally everybody talks about and has already spoken about so I won't spend too much time on them but they do need mentioning. So the first two biggest ones are G, CH, and R, which is just an R sound and these are very common pronunciations in German and you know they're guttural noises and they can be very uncomfortable to pronounce for some people. I think about it all the time, I'm like what happens when a German person gets sick? What happens if they have a sore throat? Do they just abstain from words that have ch and r in them? I wouldn't want to pronounce those words. Thankfully for me I had already learned French or like I had already you know begun learning French by the time that I started learning German so the r sound was already down pat but it also needs mentioning that not all regions or like not all German speaking regions pronounce these the same way. They vary a lot between like not just parts of Germany but also in other German speaking countries and that's what you know makes them really really easy to distinguish accents sometimes so you know there is a light to all the darkness. <laughs> you know for CH some people say H and some people say like H or like you know it's more of like a softer SH kind of sound and for R's you know some people say H and some people trill them like R. Um, when I was in high school my German teacher she was from like the south of Germany I don't think she spoke like um, Bavarian per se, but she spoke German with a Bavarian accent. These two sounds are what make it really interesting to listen to German from different regions and countries because they're always like the biggest tells, but simultaneously some of the hardest sounds. So I guess my advice for these two sounds would just be like to try to make them consistent because what I do hear a lot of times from beginner German speakers is that they mix them. So sometimes they'll be like R and sometimes they say sh. Sometimes they go R and sometimes they go R and I'm just like ah. Kind of makes your German sound like a quilt because you're just taking, you know, pronunciations from all over. I mean, if that's what you're going for, then go ahead. But I personally did not take that route. And next, I would say the most difficult set of sounds for German learners, especially beginner German learners, are vowels, especially vowels with umlauts. So I'm talking e, u, and u. These sounds are not very common in a lot of languages, maybe in, in Europe a little bit, but I think for most of us, we're not just we're just not used to stretching and moving our mouths in that way, so I'm honestly not surprised. But you do have to put the work in on those. <laughs> and it's tricky because even if you do memorize like certain umlaut sounds, you have to remember random things like um like a with an umlaut, eh, when you 
put it in a diphthong with U, it becomes oi. So the equivalent of EU. I mean, diphthongs in general are difficult, you know, remembering like E versus I, owl versus oi, and stuff like that. So when you throw a diphthong in there, it just like makes your brain do like a processing time thing. I play the cello, I'm a cello player, and I remember that when I was in high school, um, for the first time I encountered a piece called Träumerei, which means like um, daydreaming. about had a f***ing stroke trying to read that word because I was like trauma trauma a bitch was traumatized after seeing that word do not recommend okay so now moving on from the basic stuff that everybody complains about all the time I wanted to talk about like some more specific things that I hear people making mistakes on that kind of hinders their German from sounding completely 100% natural. You have to pay attention to S's when they precede T's and P's because I hear people all the time, they say stuff like stop and spiel, but it's not stop and spiel, it's stop and spiel. So when S's come before T's and P's, they assume an SH sound, not an S sound. I think a lot of people forget this, um, especially people from the US because we do have these words, like we have the word stop in English, so when we see stoppen, we're not gonna say stoppen, like it's kind of, we just forget to because we have something that's similar. But that is super important. Adjectives and adverbs that end in I-G. Stop making the G sound so damn hard. If you listen closely to a native German speaker, you are more likely to hear them say häufig than häufig. Häufig is like, I see the G. You know, you, you want to pay attention to that G. You don't, you don't want to make it feel left out. I get that. But you gotta smooth it out, right? I think we sometimes, we think that German is such a harsh language that we have to pronounce every single word very harshly. That is a stereotype. German is actually, most of the times, very, very soft. For example, take the word häufig. You see, on there's an IG there, but it's soft. Häufig. It kind of, it's not really like a CH sound. It's kind of like if a G and a CH sound had a baby. Just chill out, let it just dissolve. Häufig. Gleichzeitig. Lebendig. Oh shit, a bug just flew into my window and killed itself. So the final two things, this is the penultimate thing I'm going to talk about. It's not so much like specific sounds or pronunciations, but strategies um, and like things that native German speakers do that makes their language sound like, you know, a lot quicker and a lot more fluid. And these two things have taken me such a long time, like a lot of listening practice, close listening to kind of incorporate naturally. So thank me later. It's so bright all of a sudden. Is that better? So first talking about endings. Um, sometimes endings on German words, especially verbs, just disappear. Or they're like reduced or something. It's kind of hard for me to describe, so I'd rather just show it through examples. Okay, so listen to these two examples, especially focus on the word haben, and tell me what sounds different. Man muss viele Bücher lesen, um ein besseres Leben zu haben. Man muss viele Bücher lesen, um ein besseres Leben zu haben. So between these two examples, we see kind of like an almost like mumbling or just like an elimination or a reduction of the bun sound in haben. So um ein besseres Leben zu haben versus ein besseres Leben zu haben. That is like 99% of the time if people are speaking quickly, that's what you're going to hear. People don't always speak so clearly with like Leben, haben, it's like Leben, haben. It's kind of trippy, right? It's kind of trippy for me too. Um, another good example is with some verbs that end in K-E-N. So like for example, the, the verb merken, which means to, to realize or to remember. Um, ich kann deinen Namen nicht merken. Oder ich kann deinen Namen nicht merken. The, the kun, it's not so harsh, you know, you don't pronounce it so harshly. It kind of just buckles onto itself, like merken. So in a conversation, or if you're watching a video where native speakers are speaking, make sure you listen to the ends of like infinitive verbs and stuff like that. Or just these like endings in general, and most of the time they are going to buckle. Okay, and the final thing I wanted to talk about, it kind of encompasses a lot of different things and instances, but I couldn't really, I, I thought it would be pretty tedious to talk about them separately because they're pretty specific, so I just put them all under the umbrella of what I call cutting where necessary. Three things that Germans do all the time. They often contract words, cut small syllables where they think that they can be shorter, or they will just like leave final letters off of verb conjugations. So here are some of the most common examples of these things that I can remember off the top of my head. Die Blumen sind auf dem Tisch. Ich denke ans Team. So these are two examples of contractions uh, because normally these preposition and article combos would be auf dem and an das. 
class. Keep in mind though that alfum is sort of like, it's more of a spoken contraction that I don't think it's, it's not actually grammatically correct, whereas andas, turning into ans, that is like a, that's grammatically correct. So in general, they like apply these to spoken and written speech, but yeah. Something that also counts toward cutting where necessary is shortenings of definite articles. So like, es gibt eine ganze Menge. It's not eine ganze Menge, it's eine ganze Menge. Um, if you say, ich, ich habe ein gutes Kenntnis davon. It's not ein gutes Kenntnis, it's ein gutes Kenntnis. Literally, definite articles are never more than two syllables, but even that is too much for some Germans. They're just like, no, na. Mm, we're cutting the shit back. So moving on, you might have seen from that last example that instead of ich habe, I said ich hab. This is a very common shortening of first person present conjugations. I think they do it with some other like, you know, verb forms, but this is like the one that I guess I see most often. So for example, ich habe das noch nicht getan. It's not ich habe das noch nicht getan, it's ich habe das noch nicht getan. But this isn't just with have, and they also do this like, I hear it all the time, like ich schreibe, ich gehe, anything really. Also building upon that, um, when you have inversion in a sentence, and inversion is something really common in German, like with, you know, because of a certain grammatical situation, the verb will go in front of the subject instead of, you know, how it normally goes. So like, heute werde ich bei meiner Mutter bleiben. They're not saying, heute werde ich bei meiner Mutter bleiben, it's werde ich. Da fällt mir ein, I just thought of a sentence that actually Actually exemplifies a lot of the things that I'm talking about just to give you I guess a little example in a, a practical like real life example. Heute werde ich dir einen Brief schreiben. So we got werde ich. We got nun instead of einen. We got schreiben instead of schreiben. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like these are, you know, they may sound like just little things, but they they really do pile up inside of a sentence and like inside of everyday speech. Oh my god. I think I'm gonna stop there though, because uh, my brain is going to explode. Like these are these are things that I apply in my speech all the time, but when I talk about them, it does start to sound a little overwhelming. So I'm gonna spare you. Also, ich hoffe dieses Video euch hilfreich ist. Ich bin gar keine Expertin, aber ich bin eine Person, die ganz viel Erfahrung hat und ich denke, dass das etwas wert ist. Es macht mir sehr froh, äh, euch mit eurer deutschen Aussprache helfen zu können. Ähm, vielleicht in der Zukunft, ich kann mehr Videos so machen, wenn ihr das wollt. Um, so, thank you so much for tuning in. I will be back soon, probably with more German videos, because that's really what I've been feeling and studying the most recently, so makes sense, right? As Angela Merkel would say, don't do drugs, stay in school, and I'll catch you on the flip. Tschüss!